Good evening, everyone. Well, it's evening for me, maybe day for you when you watch this. I wanted to go ahead and tell you all about a story. And, um, it's about this kid, and he's going through a lot of hard things in life. Um, just to give you a little bit of a bra background, uh, basically, uh, silent type in school, didn't have a lot of friends, and, you know, uh, his father and him used to be really active, and his mother and stuff, well, he's going through the high school years, you know, going through what you do in those years. Well, that year, his mother passes away. She, she dies. And so, basically, his, his family, he, he, he's, his life is just impacted by that. His dad's life is impacted by that because he loved his wife. And, um, so he, he's, you know, dealing with this, going through the school year, and, and, uh, towards spring, you know, towards the end of the school year, um, the kid actually starts to get a, a blur in his vision. Um, he basically starts to, to, like, run into doors and into lockers and stuff like that because his depth perception is off. Well... You know, the, the uh, school nurse uh, called the father and says, you need to get him in to see a doctor. And he went to go see a doctor, and the doctor says, I think you need to go and see a specialist that, you know, deals with vision. I, I don't know the correct terminology. Um, so they do, and it, lo and behold, that uh, he's starting to go blind a little bit. Not fully blind, but uh, to the enough where it's dangerous for him. Okay. So, you know, also during this part in life that his dad just kind of just shuts him out of his life. That his, you know, his dad's going through the, the coping loss. Uh, he, he's trying to come to terms with, you know, the loss of his wife. And that, you know, he, he loves so much. And, and the love the fact that they spent so much time as a family. And so the kid, you know doesn't have a lot of interaction with his father anymore and he's now becoming blind basically so it's now the end of the school year and you know the few friends that he does have can't really hang out with them because he's going blind so it's now summertime and so the kid just says well my friends don't want to hang out with me because I'm blind and you know whatever I'll just you know spend time at home and where they lived was basically right on the coast right on the coast beautiful landscape, you know, and, you know, there's chores to be done that, you know, they always do yearly, and one of those is to hang up boards on the house windows for when storms come in the, in the you know, later part of the summer and, and fall for, you know, if a hurricane starts or some type of tropical storm so the windows don't get shattered. Well, they got, they got two windows up on the, uh, first story of the house and then they have a bunch around the house on the lower levels so story goes basically um, the father at the beginning of the summer you know tells the son that we need to get this done so the kid kind of rides it off like he's joking because you know he's basically blind so you know months go by it's you know going through midsummer and and uh, his father comes up and says, you need to get this done. He says, okay. And just kind of, you know, what a normal teenager does. Rolls his eyes, puts his music back on, and goes about his business of his day. Tongue tie there. <laughs> um, so it's getting towards the end of the summer when the storms start developing and, um, and it's starting to get into fall season. Well, his father is now furious comes up into his room early in the morning, turns on the light, goes up to his son and says, son, you need to get this done today. He says, I got to go. We need to get this done by the time I get back. So the kid's like, okay, he really means this. So, and he, he says, get up now and, and start on it. So he basically does and He's getting ready and everything, and basically, here's his dad leave. So 
so he's walking outside and mind you he can't see that well he's going blind he can't see that far in front of him so he's feeling around in the shed and everything for the ladder and and uh, finally he he finds it he drags that out you know sets it into place same thing with the board same, same thing with the nails same thing with the hammer so he starts on the lower part of the house like everybody would and because uh, that's the easiest part right so he gets that done and then he's like okay great you know it, it's starting to get a little bit darker out so my vision's you know getting really really blurry but you know out of infuriation even though he's scared to death of falling off the roof to his death probably or paralyzation if that's a word so again he's looking for the ladder and he's feeling around and finally he feels it and you know he sets it up on the siding of the of the house and he brings up the boards and then goes down for the nail and hammers or the nail and hammer and he, he gets up there and he I mean this is an hour process that usually doesn't take more than just an hour probably this is hours later because it takes so much time so he's he, he's hammering up the boards on the on the windows and Finally, he gets done, and he he's he got his you know his nails and his hammer that are left on him, and he's feeling around for that ladder, and finally he finds it, goes down the ladder, and then just kind of just kind of sits there. Then then his uh he hears his dad come back up. He's home and he says, "Well, come on, son, let's go let's go eat." He said, "You know." You gotta understand, this kid's probably pissed off. I mean, his his dad just made it, just put him in danger. The fact that it was starting to get a little bit stormy out probably darkened his vision where he could barely even see after he got the first level done. So he's sitting there, and the, the kid's basically not even wanting to eat. And uh, finally, his father stops and says, "Son, I'm proud of you." And he says, "How?" He says. Why? He says, because you did something that I knew was going to be difficult. He says, yeah, about that. You know, he, he then just opens up on his father. He's just basically like, you put my life in danger. You, you made me do something incredibly dangerous to where I could have fell off the roof and died. And, you know, you basically just, that hurt, that scares me that my father would do that. And his father stops eating. And he says, son, let me tell you something. And you got to imagine the kid is just infuriated. He's probably like, what? He said, I was with you the whole time. He said, you wouldn't have found that ladder if I hadn't placed it in front of you. He said, son, you wouldn't have been able to find the nails, the hammer, or the boards that I set in front of you. He said, even when you were on the lower part of the house, where you could stand on the ground, where it was safe, I was so close to you, I could reach out and touch you. He said, when you went up on that ladder... I went with you. He said, "If you were to fall, you wouldn't have hit the gr you wouldn't have hit the ground. You wouldn't even hit the roof. I would have caught you. I was with you the whole time." Basically, the father drove down to the into the property and walked back and was there with his son the whole time. This is a parallel, if you will. People, let me tell you something. If you go and look at my testimony, whether you believe in God or not, let me tell you something. Just because you don't believe in him, he's still there. You ever wonder how you got home that night when you were so drunk you could barely even see yourself? 
And somehow, you woke up in your driveway. Or maybe you did drugs to the point of overdosing and you were trying to overdose, maybe kill yourself, and yet you wake up the next morning and you feel refreshed. Or, or for myself, I was sexually molested as a child. God was still with me. I became a Satanist and hated God. God was still with me. I became a gangbanger. Lost my faith. I gave my life to the Lord when I was 14. I was a Satanist when I was very little. I mean, I basically call myself a Satanist. I wasn't in the occult or anything like that. But I worship Satan. But God was still with me. Close enough to where if I were to fall, and I did, he caught me. Every single surgery that I've been through in my life, and I've been through 12 of them, 12 major surgeries, I'm 25 years old. And the three times that I've only died from my medical problems, God was still with me. Even when I turned against him. Even when I fell from my faith in my teen years and got into the game banging life. And when I went to job court and fell back into Satanism a little bit more. And was doing the game banger style stuff. God was still with me. The times that I didn't understand why he was putting me through what he did, he was still with me. So, rather you want to believe in him or not, he's with you right now. Rather you're drinking right now, wondering why life is the way it is, you're coping with the loss of a loved one, he is with you. The only difference is between you and I. Is I willingly turn and ask him to walk with me. That I would give him my hand and he would lead me. And if I started to go ahead of him, he would be behind me to catch me. What I'm getting at is this, is God is with you your whole life. Rather you know him or you don't. The only difference is, is one day he will call our name. And that day, he will either tap you on the shoulder and you'll turn to him and say, hey, I was with you the whole time. The only difference is, is whether you knew him or not because that's the time where he will depart from you and he doesn't want to do that and the Bible says it's clear that he knitted us together in our mother's womb he knew us before we were born and he placed us in the areas in our lives that we may have not planned I was planning on becoming a military contractor I've tried three times to serve my country in the military and but because of my medical problems it didn't work I tried twice to become a military contractor until recently where he told me to do ministry. And he's been with me the whole time. And whatever you're going through in your life right now, I just want you to know that God loves you and he is with you. You may say, well, my sin's too bad to be forgiven. That is no, that is, that is no such thing as too bad of sin. It says in the Bible that there is no equal, there is no less or greater value of sin. That is all the same. It's the stains in our life, but you know what? Jesus died for that stain and washed it clean. You may say, well, I'm not worthy. He said, yes, you are because I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to die for you. That I'm going to take your punishment upon myself so you don't have to. And so that you can spend eternity with me as you were created to. Rather, whatever you believe right now, I want you to tell you something. There is one true God and he loves you so much that he has made promise after promise and fulfilled them. And is about to fulfill one big one and it is his return. So right now, if you don't know him and you want to know him, as I, I believe many people do, want to know Jesus. Want to know the king that came on this earth as complete flesh that battled temptation but never sinned was a king but lived a poor man's life and helped many people that even hurt him 
that forgave the people that hurt him and persecuted him. That even died for the ones that nailed him to the cross. People, stop living in your sinful ways. What I mean by that is he paid for them. He nailed them to the cross when his flesh was nailed to the cross. He allowed himself to be broken for us that are broken so we may be fixed by his broken body. When he said it was finished, it was finished. So if you would like to give your life to Jesus tonight, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I see and know that I have fallen short of your glory. Lord, I feel as if as if I'm unworthy of you and unworthy to receive you. But Lord, I do believe you love me. And out of that love, you died for every single person on this earth, past and present. So they may so they may have eternal life with you. Lord, I thank you for dying on the cross for me, for paying for my sins. Lord, I believe you died on the cross for me and you rose again, that you beat the grave. And before you went up to heaven, you made two promises that you went to prepare a place for me and that one day you would return. Lord Jesus, I ask you forgiveness of my sins. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart and into my life. I ask you, Lord, to show me how to walk in faith, that I give you my hand for you to guide me. And in your name, Lord Jesus, I am saved and I am forgiven. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Let me just tell you something before I let you go. This is just amazing. It really is. Your name is now being written in the book of life, of eternal life. Your eternity, your, <laughs> your eternal life starts right now. The body may die, but the soul lives on forever. And you're given a new body, a perfect body in heaven that lives on forever. That you will receive an eternal love that is never broken. And that angels are partying in the streets right now. That Jesus himself is smiling so big that it, it, it lights the world up. God bless you all and have a good day or evening.